Okay, so I'm going to be telling you about soft matter physics. Uh, and before I get started, I want to also say that uh, throughout this talk, feel free to stop and ask me questions. I'm not in a hurry. We're going to easily finish by 10 o'clock. Uh, so feel free to ask questions if anything's confusing in the middle of the talk. All right. So soft matter. What are soft materials? Uh, soft materials are pretty common. So food is a soft material. Uh, toothpaste, shampoo, a lot of consumer products would be considered soft materials. Uh, sand piles, so if you're walking along a beach, uh, or if you have foam, like when you're shaving, if you have shaving cream foam, all of these are soft materials. Um, and somewhat intermediate between liquids and solids, and they're often mixtures of different components. And it's the mixture, it's the fact that you're mixing together some simple ingredients, but then the mixture is complicated. That's what makes it an interesting material. So why should we study soft materials? Uh, there's going to be a lot of cool physics, which is what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk, but I want to give you some sense of the big picture as well. Uh, so I'm a physicist, and I work in an academic laboratory, and I tend to do very you know, simple uh, model system experiments and so forth. But there is a lot of relevance for the real world. So food, as I mentioned, is a soft material. We've been eating a lot of soft materials for lunch and dinner. Um, and so, for example, suppose you want to make a healthier food product or maybe something that is cheaper. So you want to change the ingredients of the food product, but you want the texture to be the same. If you're going to have gluten-free pasta, you want it to be the same texture as regular pasta. So how do you engineer the properties of the material with different ingredients to give you the same textures? So a chemist might tell me what kind of uh, chemicals to put in the food, or you know, some food chemist would tell me what kind of chemicals. I would say, if you're going to put in those chemicals, they have a different density or a different viscosity, or something is different about them. And so here's how to modify the food so that it has the same texture and the same appearance uh, as what you would normally expect. Um, also, improving shelf life. There's a lot of food products that when they go bad, they're not actually chemically bad for you. They're not full of contaminants or not something that would harm you to eat it. It's just that the texture changes. And at that point, the food is no longer, uh, it doesn't taste any good or it doesn't seem right. So people have to throw out food, not because it's chemically bad, but because the texture has changed. So if there's a way to make that shelf life longer for the texture, that could be useful. Uh, the other big category of soft materials is biology. So we're all squishy materials, right? If you think about what, what fraction of the human body is water? What is it, like 90? OK, so we're 90% water, but yet somehow we're not puddles on the ground. And this is good, right? So why is that? What are the mechanical properties of cells? What is it about the stuff inside our cells that gives us some texture and gives us some stiffness so that we're not just liquids? Um, clearly, the 10% of us that's not water is a pretty important 10%. So again, you'd like to understand this, and then maybe when cells go bad, you'd like to understand the soft mechanics of that as well. Um, but again, I really want to focus on the physics of all this in the talk. Um, so there might be some applications near the end of the talk, but for right now, I'm going to be focusing more on the basic physics. All right. So sometimes I call this squishy physics, uh, but the technical term for this field is often soft condensed matter. And my definition of what this is, this is a study of soft systems. Uh, and there's a lot of examples. I'm going to define what some of these examples are. So these are, right now, just think of them as words that you may or may not know. But they're just a variety of kinds of materials. Sometimes they're called complex fluids. And the key question is relating the microscopic properties to the macroscopic properties. So if you have food products, so the, it, the textures might be developed on a scale of, of micrometers. But then what you care about is how they spread when you, you know, spread butter across bread or you know, how they feel in your mouth, macroscopic things. Or skin lotions. If you're rubbing cream on your arm, you want it to feel right. That's a macroscopic property. But that depends on the details that are going on at the micron scale. Usually not the atomic scale, but usually the micron scale. All right. So my favorite example, because a lot of my research relates to, is colloids. So colloids are small solid particles in a liquid. Uh, so paint is a colloid. When you paint a wall, you want it to be a liquid. But then when the liquid evaporates, you want the particles stuck on the wall to give you the color. So that paint is a colloid. Blood is a colloid. Uh, toothpaste. So by small, they're typically nanometers to micron scale. Uh, you, want them to, you want to think of them as spherical objects. You don't want to think about them as chemicals or molecules. You want them to be spheres. We're physicists, right? We like spheres. I'm a physicist. I like spheres. Uh, thermal energy is important. 
They do Brownian motion. So the energy scale that's often relevant you think about is KT. And they're nice because you can see them with a microscope. Um, they move kind of on human time scales. You can often do video microscopy. You can do tabletop science. Uh, so they're, they're a nice thing to start with. They're a nice thing to study. And the most uh, basic thing to start with is Brownian motion and diffusion. So how do these things move around due to thermal energy? Uh, so they're not moving ballistically. They're not moving with constant velocity. They're just jiggling around. I'm going to show you a movie in a second. And you have the mean square displacement, delta r squared. It's now going uh, linearly with the, with the lag time delta t. So the, as, it, as it diffuses, it spreads out, but it kind of spreads out. Uh, the size of a diffusing blob spreads out as the square root of time. It's spreading out slower. And the diffusion coefficients related to the thermal temperature, so this is kt, thermal energy, uh, the viscosity eta, and the particle radius a. And just for fun, I'm going to show you a movie here. So this is a real-time movie of micron radius particles that are just doing Brownian motion in a liquid, uh, taken with microscopy. This is in the middle of a sample, so sometimes they go in and out of focus. Um, and in just a second, we're going to switch to a denser view. So this is more like a paste, something that would be more like toothpaste, where they're kind of crowded in, but they still do Brownian motion. They still jiggle around. They can still rearrange. So this is what Brownian motion looks like under a microscope. I forget, Pietro, have you been doing Brownian motion in your hand? Yeah, so the people coming from the they are really lucky. Okay, good. So, and so some of you have seen Brownian motion already last week in Pietro's session. Great. Uh, just to briefly say how you would calculate a mean square displacement, uh, you look at a particle of trajectory. You can maybe measure with particle tracking or measure it some other way. You look at displacement, so you subtract the motion at one time later from the time now, and then you would square this and average this over all particles in all time, just to say how you would measure this kind of thing. All right. The next bit of physics I want to teach you is about sedimentation. So the particles are often not the same density as the liquid. In fact, it's hard to make them exactly the same density. So you, at best, you can make it close to the same density. So they like to fall, or maybe they're lighter than liquid, and then they like to float up. But there's also a drag force that prevents them from going infinitely fast, or they don't, they don't accelerate. They, they reach a constant velocity. This is the Stokes drag force. So again, it depends on the viscosity. It depends on the particle radius A. And, it and then it depends on the velocity. So the faster they move, the more the drag force. Of course, what's making them go up or down is the uh, buoyant force, the uh, gravitational force. So either they're floating up because they're, they're lighter than the liquid or they're floating down. And so it depends on the density difference. It depends on the volume. So the volume of the particle is 4 thirds pi A cubed and then times G. All right. That seems good. Particle falls down. Stokes drag force. All right. Now I know it's Monday morning, and I know I've just kind of got started the talk, but now it's time for you to do some work. Uh, I've got some problems I want you to think about. Actually, I want you to do the problems to be more specific. So I'd like you to balance the drag force and the gravitational force and figure out how fast do particles sediment. How fast do particles sediment? I want you to separately balance out the gravitational potential energy, mgh, with kt. So when you find the particles sitting, sinking on the bottom, they also still have thermal energy. So there's a scale height. So not all, the density varies with height. This is very similar to the atmosphere, right? The, the atmospheric pressure is biggest down here at sea level, and it gets uh, smaller pressure as you go up due to kt of energy. So this I want you to do the same thing for colloids. So how high can they go by balancing out kT of energy to mgh? And the last thing is, when you're diffusing, I want you to solve using plugging in for d, when is the time, typically, that particles have moved their own size, so a, or I guess plugging in for a squared. OK, go. You are allowed to talk with your neighbor, especially if you think that they have something useful to say about this. <laughs>
If you have any uh, questions or need any assistance, raise your hand. Or if you get an answer, so raise your hand. You don't give people uh, numbers for G or KBT? I want formula. You want just formula. I want you formula. Want numbers or I'll give you numbers in a minute. Thank you. No questions yet? Or answers? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just, just to be clear, you want to you want to be looking for your answers in terms of A. So you don't want D in your answer. You just want A. Or A and other factors like the viscosity and so forth. Do you need maybe one more minute? Who wants who wants me to keep going and who wants one more minute? One more minute? That's a couple of people are nodding, all right. Sorry I'm making you work on Monday morning. No, 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 no. Get some answers? No? Do you have answers? Yeah, that's right. So just solve that for. This all for V, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
All right. Uh, let's look at some answers. OK, so for the first one, you're balancing forces. And this is the formula for the sedimentation velocity. Uh, the key thing is that it goes as a squared. So if you got that the sedimentation velocity went as something times a squared, you, you should feel good. If you didn't get the 2 ninths, you probably just made some algebra mistake. You'd get it right if you had more time. But it should go as a squared. Uh, for the scale height, it goes as inverse a cubed. So you've got kt on the top. You've got an mg on the bottom. And that ends up going as inverse with a to the 3, a cubed. And for the mean square displacement formula, you're just plugging in a squared for delta r squared, and, or delta x squared. And then this one goes as a cubed, because you get an extra factor of a from the d. So there's an a squared on the top from the mean square displacement, and then there's an extra a from the d. So the key thing here is to think about how these scale with a and what that means. All right, so the free factors, the two nines and the pi's and so forth, are not really the key thing about this calculation. It's about the scaling with A. So let's look at the meaning of these answers. So the sedimentation velocity goes as delta rho A squared G. What this means is that small particles sediment slowly. Big particles go quick. Like if you jump into a swimming pool, you're going to sink to the bottom more quickly because you're big. But if you're a small particle, you feel more drag force, so then you go slowly. If you, want to if you want to centrifuge small things, like viruses or something, you have to go really, really big centrifuge. You have to use the centrifuge to increase g. And it's hard because the sedimentation velocity goes as a squared. g is linear, so you have to go you know, 10 times more, or 100 times more in the centrifuge for something that's 10 times smaller. So small stuff is hard to sediment. The scale height. Uh, means that the, there's a huge size dependence on gravity. So large particles sink really, really to the bottom, and they don't distribute themselves throughout the, the system. Smaller things can distribute themselves more equally. Um, so large stuff really, really feels the influence of gravity. Um, and again, you can think about the atmosphere. This is why the atmosphere does not change dramatically from the bottom of this room to the top of this room, because gas molecules are really small. But if you went up several, like you know, to the top of a mountain, you'd start feeling the atmosphere is changing. For larger particles than, than gas molecules, this is happening over a much shorter length scale. And the diffusion time scale goes as a cubed. So this means that small particles move fast. Um, large things don't diffuse very much. Again, this is why you're not diffusing right now in this room, because you're large particles, but small things can diffuse their own size. They, they really explore their environment very rapidly. OK, let's put some numbers on this. Uh, let's consider two examples. So these are both typical kinds of examples studied by uh, labs around the world. One would be polystyrene particles. Uh, this is the same plastic that's in styrofoam. So if we had micron-sized uh, particles in water, and then another would be a system that we study in my lab a lot, which is uh, polymethyl methacrylate. That's the same plastic that's plexiglass or leucite. Um, so here we can make the, the solvent much more close to the density of the particles uh, to, to try and turn off gravity. So the sedimentation velocity for polystyrene is slow, uh, a tenth of a micron per second. But for the density match system, it's even slower, so a nanometer per second, really, really slow. Um, the scale height is two microns for polystyrene particles. So that would mean that if you had a sample, like, like a microscope chamber with polystyrene particles in it, you would expect to see them you know, kind of near the bottom of the slide, maybe a micron or two off. But you wouldn't see that many that would be 100 microns away from the, the bottom of the slide. They'd mostly be near the bottom. The, uh, other particles, the density match ones, can go 200 microns. So in a thin sample chamber, you'd see them kind of evenly spread throughout the sample chamber. But if I handed you a jar of these, you'd say, OK, they're going to be mostly on the bottom, because they just don't have enough energy to be up at the top of the jar so easily. Um, and then the diffusion time scale is about the same for both of these, because it doesn't depend on the density. It just depends on the viscosity. All right. Let's now look at the effective size. So if I look at just polystyrene particles and compare the small ones I just talked about to large ones, and by large, let's just say 100 microns. So you could see these with your eye, but not easily. right? These aren't huge, 100 microns. But a lot of these depend on A to some higher power. 
So the sedimentation velocity now is millimeters per second. If you had a jar of these and you shook them up, you could see them sinking slowly in the jar, and after a minute or so, they'd be at the bottom of the jar. So that's pretty fast velocity. Uh, the scale height is two picometers. These things, once they're on the bottom of the jar, they're, they're going to stay there until you stir them up. They're not going to go anywhere due to thermal energy. So, so thermal energy is you know, it's a certain amount, but it's not enough to lift these particles up off the bottom of the jar. They're really at the bottom, and they're going to stay there unless you do something to lift them up. And diffusion takes now, it goes as A cubed, so when the particle size goes up by 100, the diffusion time scale goes up by a million. And so it takes nine days for them to diffuse their own size. So diffusion is off. These things don't diffuse. So this is usually what you think of as a not colloidal particle. It's something that is extremely heavy in terms of this kind of reasoning and something that just doesn't diffuse anymore. So KT is no longer helping this do anything interesting. And this is what makes large particles distinctly different physics from small particles, among other things. Okay, and again, the point of this exercise was that just knowing a few of these really simple formulas, you can work out the scaling with the particle size and start thinking through some of the physics of this. That's really an approach that's often very useful in soft matter, is to think through just the scaling with particle size. Any questions so far? Everyone's okay? All right. Uh, so to sum up on colloids, the important point is that the small size of these things is important. Uh, the scaling with A is really the main message I'm trying to tell you, not the exact formulas, but the scaling. Large particles, so anything much larger than 10 microns, is not really thermal. You no longer think about diffusion or things like, or KT of energy once you get very large. Um, so that's why the boulders outside are much different than colloids. Uh, and the other thing is that, in some sense, this means that as particle size gets really, really small, you can stop thinking about gravity. You no longer need to worry about gravity if you're talking about things that are nanometer sized. Um, one time somebody was telling me about a simulation they had done where they were doing molecular dynamics of atoms in a material, and they were claiming that gravity was doing something. I, I'm just like, no, that can't be true. Because when you get really, really small, gravity cannot be playing a role. At, at, because the thermal energy is so much more important than gravitational energy, for example. So this really means that it, the smaller it gets, the more you can just stop thinking about gravity, and that's a very useful simplification. Okay, that's all I have to say about colloids. Everybody seems okay. Let's move on to emulsions. So emulsions are what we're using in our hands-on module. So half of you have seen this, and half of you are seeing it right now. Um, these are liquid droplets in another liquid, like oil and water. And you have to have a soap of some sort, a surfactant molecule that coats these droplets that prevents the droplets from coalescing and coming together and turning into bigger droplets. Uh, so examples are things like butter and mayonnaise, so a lot of food products. Skin lotions are usually emulsions. And the samples in our hands-on module. Um, so the, the surfactants are these molecules like this. They have a part that likes to be in water and a part, a tail, that likes to be in oil. So these molecules like to coat the, the boundaries so they can have the part that wants to be in water be in water, the other part be in oil. This makes the surfactants very happy. And then it means that the oil droplets, when they come together, they, just, they bump into their surfactants. They don't end up coalescing as much. Uh, so what makes these different from colloids are that these are now softer things. They can deform. Um, and you have a surface tension now, and the surface tension makes all the difference. All right, how many people feel they understand surface tension really well? One, maybe. So what is surface tension? Uh, surface tension, the, the simplest way to think about this is it's an energy cost to have a, an interface. Um, so if you have a droplet of radius A, then the, the surface area is proportional to A squared. And so the energy that that surface requires is uh, gamma times A squared with you know, factors of pi and so forth. So if you're, for example, then if you're going to make an emulsion, so you've got some oil and some water and some surfactant, what you could do is you could just take it and shake it really, really hard, right? You, you're putting in energy to try and break up these droplets. Uh, again, half of you have done this in our module already. So what, it, what does that energy do? Well, it goes to make the surface. So if you think about how much surface you have to make, if you've got a volume V of the emulsion, 
You can roughly guess at the number of droplets because it's, each droplet is, you know, has a volume related to A cubed. So the number of droplets is V divided by A cubed. Then the energy of the surface goes as A squared. So the total area you're making is the volume, or it's the number of droplets times A squared, or the volume divided by A. So the amount of energy you have to put into shaking the sample goes as V times gamma divided by A. The smaller you want to make the droplets, the more energy you have to put in. So if you're trying to make some kind of skin cream uh, in industry that is made out of oil and water, you have to have a mixer, and this tells you how much energy you have to expend on your mixing process to make the sample with droplets of smaller sizes. So small sizes require you to mix that much harder. It's going to be that much more power to run your factory. All right, does this make sense? And you can, you can change this by changing the surface tension. So you can certainly try to make it easier by adding in more surfactants or surfactants that modify the surface tension. But the bottom line is if you want to make really small droplets, you've got to work harder because that requires more energy just to make the surface. You don't get surface for free. All right. Uh, this is now a question which I'm not going to make you work through. You've already worked hard once. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through this one. Uh, this is a very straightforward question. If we had water leaking from above in this room and it was coming down to the ceiling tiles, at what size are the droplets when they drip off the ceiling? This is a really critical question if we start getting leaked from upstairs. We need to know this, right? How big are these droplets? So what you can do is you can think of as it's uh, coming off the ceiling, let's just approximate everything as a sphere because we're physicists or I'm a physicist, so that's what I do. Everything's a sphere. So figure out the change in potential energy, gravitational energy, for a spherical droplet to descend from the ceiling. Right? If it can drop a distance A below the ceiling, then it might have a chance to actually drop off and then go the rest of the way. But the first thing it's going to do is kind of form a bump that comes down by distance A. But to do that costs surface energy. So if you just have water on a, on, as a flat layer, you kind of minimize the surface energy. But as it falls down, you're making more surface. So that's a cost. You get a reward for going down, but you pay this cost. So you can try and balance these things out and ask where does the reward and the cost equal each other? I'm going to do this, but does this make sense as, a, as an idea for how we're going to set the problem? OK. So the change in gravitational potential energy, so it's going to be mga from, from gravitational potential energy. The m depends on the volume. So this goes as a to the fourth, droplet size to the fourth power. So you get a cubed from the volume, and then you get an extra a, because that's how far we really want it to go is that distance. For surface tension, uh, this is just the surface, of the, the surface of the spherical droplet. So this is 4 pi a squared. So this goes as a squared. So we want to check these things. We want to compare them. So one of these goes as a to the fourth. One goes as a squared. So the ratio of these goes as a squared, which means that if a is really, really small, then this ratio gets smaller. So then uh, to make any bump of a, of a really small size, it's just really costly in terms of surface tension. It doesn't give you enough reward in terms of gravitational potential energy. So you don't make small droplets. If you make big droplets, if I try to you know, dump a bucket of water out, gravitational energy really controls it, so everything falls. It's right when they're in balance is with the size of the droplet. So we can do this with numbers. So here's the exact formulas. We equate, if we set this ratio equal to 1, we can say what's the size so that this ratio is equal to 1. And plugging in the actual surface tension between water and air, you get a droplet size of about 4 millimeters in, in radius. So about eight millimeters in diameter. So if there's a catastrophic leak of water from upstairs and starts dripping to the ceiling, you're going to get hit with droplets of about this size. And this should kind of make sense, right? If you've ever seen water dripping off things, this is about the size that you get. Uh, this is also the same kind of physics that tells you that the bugs that can walk on water are roughly millimeter in size. And you, which are much larger, cannot walk on water because you will, you're, the water will doesn't care about surface energy. The water just says if, if you walk on it, you, there's a huge reward in terms of gravitational energy for sinking through the water. 
Okay. Any questions about this solution? I am going to be posting a copy of these notes on the Google Drive, so you'll have, a, you'll have all this and you can go back through it into more detail if you need it. Okay, so implications for emulsion droplets, they like to be round because they minimize surface energy, and that's tr more and more true the smaller you are. The smaller you are, the more surface tension becomes important. So in this kind of image of the emulsion, the small droplets, those are the ones that are the really circular ones, and the large droplets are the ones that are kind of squishy and being deformed because then other forces can be more significant. But the smaller you are, the more round you're going to be. Um, and you can, you can modify this argument with surfactants, which modify the surface tension, but really it's the size that makes a bigger difference than the surface tension. Okay. One more material, foams. So foams are basically emulsions, but rather than having oil in the, in the droplets, you're going to have air. Um, you still need soap to make a foam. So this is just soapy water and air. Um, and we added some red dye to make it look interesting, but it's, it's basically just a, b air bubbles. All right, so foams are, are straightforward in that sense. Let me talk now about one more property of these kind of materials. So toothpaste is a, is a paste of colloids. And then we have shaving cream here, which is a foam. Whoa, no, go back. Here we go. So these things are soft and squishy. So the technical term for this is viscoelastic. So here we are, we're making a pile of toothpaste on the table. And again, you cannot do this with water. I cannot make a pile of water on the table. Um, if I squeeze harder, it goes out faster, but it depends on how hard I'm pushing. With a foam, we've got soapy water and air. And again, both these things are fluids but you can make a pile of shaving cream on the table and it holds its own weight. And you can't do this with either soapy water or air by themselves. The other thing though is that under some force, these will flow pretty easily. So they're not very hard solids. They squish out <laughs> very nicely when you apply force to them. So you can start asking questions about how much force does it take to do that? Not much, yeah. <laughs> so why are these things uh, squishy at all? Why do they have any kind of elastic properties? So suppose you have, say, an emulsion or a foam, and you try and shear it. You're trying to move the sample back and forth. You're trying to push the droplets. You're trying to push the sample. You squish the droplets. You deform the droplets, and they're no longer spherical. And that costs you surface energy, and that gives you an elastic response. So then these droplets would like to go back to their original shape. This stores energy, and that gives you the elasticity. So this is why a foam can hold up its own weight, because a foam, in order to sink, requires these droplets to change their shape, and they don't want to do that because of the surface energy, so they stay, they stay stiff in a pile. Um, if you do move around anyway, you've got a fluid back here, so they're all in a fluid, this blue stuff, so you also get a viscous response. So these materials have both elastic properties and viscous properties, and it can depend on the frequency and the amplitude. It depends on how you're forcing them, but you can get both elastic and viscous. All right. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah. If they're small enough, they're brown in motion. The movies I was showing you and the pictures I showed you were mostly larger. They were maybe like 100 microns. So there's no Brownian motion. They're like the 100 micron polystyrene particle. If you make an emulsion droplet that's a micron size, then you definitely have Brownian motion. So yeah, you can definitely you can have it, but you've got to work hard to make your small emulsion droplets. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so we're right on schedule for our one to be. We're now at the most important part of the talk. Uh, since this is Monday morning, and I know that you had a long weekend and you were probably doing things that were making you get tired and so forth, I thought I would end the talk with like 20 minutes of something that is of critical, crucial importance to many of you in this room. We're going to talk about the physics of beer foam. Uh, so now you've learned a little bit about soft materials. Let's, let's look at an application, which is beer foam. Um, and you have to understand, I don't actually drink beer. This is my friend's beer I'm holding. <laughs> I didn't even drink the, any of that. Um, but still, it's an interesting topic, so I want to talk, and, and it relates to soft materials, and it is Monday morning, so I don't want to spend the whole talk making you do algebra problems. Let's talk about the physics of beer foam. So 
you have foam on a beer, and I want to talk first about where the bubbles come from. And you all know that beer is carbonated. What can I tell you beyond just that the beer is carbonated? But let me actually tell you why the beer is carbonated. Does anyone know why the beer is carbonated? It's not the same reason as Coke. Coke, they especially add carbonation to. With beer, the process that makes beer is, uses yeast to digest sugars and other things. And the yeast release carbon dioxide, and that's what carbonates the beer. So carbonation in beer is part of the process. It's not done by us because we want to have it carbonated. It's actually, that was what the product is, is carbonated because of the yeast. All right. So you have to have surfactants. And I told you before that surfactants are soap molecules, and that does not sound like something you want in your beer. But another kind of surfactant is proteins. And so the proteins can do the same business. This is, these are kind of like more like model surfactants. Again, they've got a, a head part that likes to be in the, in the water or the beer, the tail part that likes to be in the air. Uh, for beer, it's proteins. Where do the proteins come from? Ops, maybe. Any guess where the proteins come from? Well, I guess, I guess we add organic ingredients. So, you know, you have hops or barley, whatever, there's, there's ingredients. Also, there's yeast, and yeast has protein in it. So some of the, some of the bits of yeast are, are the proteins and so forth, as well as other constituents. So you have to have the stuff to make the foam in the, in the beer. Um, and in fact, there's no surfactants in champagne or in soft drinks like Coke. This is why you don't get foam, uh, like a head of foam, on a champagne glass or on a, can on a bottle of Coke or a, a cup of Coke. Uh, what about root beer? Root beer, I'll bet they add in something that, that gives you the foam. Yeah, root beer must be, obviously has to have something else in there to give you the foam. So, but this is, this is in particular an important distinction with champagne is that there's no surfactants in champagne. All right. So the carbon dioxide comes from the fermentation process. That's what initially uh, gives you the carbonation. You can also, if you want to, you can add more carbonation later if you want a really extra carbonated beer. Uh, and then you keep the beer under pressure to keep the carbon dioxide dissolved in the beer. Um, you want it to come out only when you're pouring it. So when you pour the beer, you get mechanical agitation. Your beer is sloshing around, so that's going to release some of the amount of bubbles. Um, but then extra bubbles are released, and they just come out of the solution when the beer is in the glass. So why is that? Uh, you have to have microscopic pockets of air already present in your beer glass to give you more bubbles coming up. Uh, this is a picture from an article about beer bubbles uh, in the American Journal of Physics. So what happens is that if you have perfectly clean glass, you don't get very many bubbles coming up out of the glass, because glass is really, really smooth. But when you clean glass, you normally wipe it dry with a towel. And the towel leaves tiny, tiny cellulose fibers behind on your glass surface. And those fibers have tracked air pockets. And the air pockets are where you grow new bubbles coming from. Um, because again, remember, it takes energy to make surface, right? And there's some energy giving, because the carbon dioxide wants to get out of the beer, but it helps to start, have a starter bubble. So a little fiber like this will nucleate the growth of more bubbles coming up out of your beer. Um, and, and that really has to do with how you clean the glass and just the cellulose fibers just from drying the glasses quite often. Um, and then when the bubbles are rising up, they've got surfactants on them, which coat the bubble. That makes bubbles rise slower. So then more carbon dioxide can come into the bubble, and it gets bigger. So this is also important, and this is something that if you look at the, bub the bubbles rising in beer, they rise slower than they do in Coke. Uh, again, because of the surfactants. OK. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. This uh, uh, these foams, I mean, the foams, what kind of what is that going on between the particles? It's mostly just surface tension. So there's viscous forces because of the beer. So there's you know, hydrodynamic interactions. But uh, otherwise, the two bubbles just, uh, they've got their surface energy. So if they get crowded together, there's a penalty they pay for deforming them from spheres. So they tend to attract each other? Uh, there's a little bit of attraction, but not very much. But they kind of just, they're, they're, pushed, they're being pushed up because of gravity. And when they get to the top, they're kind of crowding because they all want to go up because of gravity. But there's a limit because to go up even more, they have to deform. And that costs you surface energy. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, these are fragile, but that's you squeezing it. You're big. You're bigger than the bubble. Actually, we can go back to my phone picture. Um, yeah, if you look at, so, nope. If you look at this picture, you can see this process. So the bubbles at the bottom are round because they're having a weak gravitational force. But up here, to get higher, you have to kind of be pushed together more. And so you're deforming, but you're paying a surface tension price at that point. To be no, to be no longer spherical costs you energy. So you have to have something else going on to make you be not round. Yeah, Mark. Um, is there a limit to how big the bubble can grow? Um, I think, pardon? I think in principle there's not really a limit, but if you had a huge bubble rising, you might think that it's going to start being sheared apart due to the viscous forces from the surrounding liquid. So, yeah, usually there's something else that cuts you off if you start making something really, really big. Why they get bigger? There's dissolved carbon dioxide in the liquid, and that gives you a reward for going into the, into the bubble. Um, and you can think of it also as the, the reward is how much carbon dioxide you have in the bubble. And that goes as the volume, A cubed. The surface penalty that you pay for making the bubble bigger only goes as A squared. So if your bubble's big enough, it wants to grow because it definitely rewards you more so than it costs you. So again, it gets back to the scaling. Reward goes as A cubed, penalty goes as A squared. It's the same thing as nucleation. Uh, fusion, that's prevented to some extent by the surfactant. No, the, the problem is that you've got these surfactant molecules and they, they interfere with each other. Um, and that, that is a strong enough interference that they can't get close enough to say, oh, actually, we'd, like to, we'd prefer to merge. There's, a, there's an energy barrier to merging. Yeah, actually, you can get diffusion between bubbles, and that can be that, that actually causes the foam to coarsen. So yeah, diffusion can give you, but, but it's hard to get them to coalesce because of the energy barriers through factors. But you're right, diffusion gives another way to get change bubble. Yeah. That's a, a good question. So it could be a size effect. But what I've read is that it's also a surface rheology effect. It's because of the surfactants coating the bubble that that slows it down a little bit. That it's a little bit more like a rigid capsule than like a free slip boundary condition on the bubble. So I'm told that the surfactants are a bigger effect. But you are absolutely right. This, there's also be a size effect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there can be a lot of different contributions. So. The nucleation of the bubbles uh, relates to these fibers. So that's certainly, in some sense, an environmental factor. If you had other things in the glass, uh, a lot of the solubility of carbon dioxide could depend on temperature, could depend on other composition factors in the beer. Um, yeah, there's a lot of extra factors that can go into this. And a lot of times, the beer companies think about these factors quite a lot. Uh, I told you about these cellulose fibers. You can also make special beer mugs that have extra ways to capture air pockets that are more better at making foam heads. So there's special beer glasses you can do, which would be an environmental factor. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to talk about one more beer topic, which is nitrogenated beer. So a lot of stout beers are foamed with nitrogen, dissolved nitrogen, rather than carbon dioxide. Um, the one on the left here is made with carbon dioxide, the one on the right is with nitrogen. So you can see the head of foam is taller, it's a little bit uh, thicker head of foam, it's different, right? So what's going on with this? The real answer is I'm not 100% sure, but I have some, some guesses uh, or some, some knowledge I've got from some places. Um, so it adds pressure, which uh, changes how it dispenses. Uh, the nitrogen is less soluble than carbon dioxide, so it changes the nature of the bubbles. And in the end, you get smaller bubbles because of this. So the bubbles are smaller, and that changes the, re the properties of the foam. 
because we've been looking at all throughout this talk how things depend on a squared or a cubed or things like that. So you know that size makes a difference. So smaller bubbles are stiffer. They, they're less easy to deform, so that gives you a thicker head of foam. Um, it doesn't nucleate the bubbles as easily. So these cellulose fibers that make bubbles, uh, you, it's harder to get that process to work with nitrogenated beer, so you have to take special measures to get the foam. And if you have a question about uh, the widget and Guinness cans, ask me about it after the talk. I've got a slide on that, but I don't want to talk about it right now. But you, the main message is special measures are needed. Um, and then the internet says that if you use argon, you get the same kind of effect as if you get nitrogen. Um, and if you can't trust the internet, who can you trust? So that's probably true. Um, when you pour a stout beer, the bubbles sometimes are observed to go down. How many people have heard of this? You've seen it. This is another video from another physics article. So this is a beer being poured. And you can see that on the right-hand side, there's stuff going down. That's bubbles that you're seeing. And they're going down. On the left-hand side, they're going up like they should be. So on the right-hand side, they're going down. Let me show one more time. You're not seeing that? OK, so come up afterwards, and you can see it. Or you can talk to Brian, who's seen it in real life. So this is, it, yeah, this is hard to see, and that's why I tried to put it on a black background. But uh, the reason why they go down is that the beer is flowing downward as it's going in the glass. It's circulating around, and some of the beer is flowing down, and then it gets back to the scaling, which is why this is in here. So the drag force for these Reynolds numbers, these these kind of problems, goes as a squared. The buoyant weight goes as a cubed, and I already just told you that the bubbles are smaller. So smaller bubbles have less of a buoyant force pulling them up. They're overwhelmed by the drag force pulling them down to go with the beer that's flowing in the glass. That's why the bubbles can go down while they're being poured in. Um, it just gets it's back to the drag force is winning out because of the scaling argument. And this doesn't happen in, in regular beer because you get the larger bubbles. All right. Finally, let's consider drainage. This is a, a movie on the left of a real beer over... Uh, I think like maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and you can see that the beer foam drains. So apparently there's beer in the foam, right? That makes sense. There's some liquid between the droplet, between the bubbles, and that liquid is beer. So when it drains out, you get more beer in the bottom of your glass and less foam. Um, and then this is the picture I showed you before. So you can kind of see that the red stuff is the liquid. So there is red stuff. There is liquid in the foam. So where is it? So let me give you a couple words about the structure of, of foam. So you have bubbles. When two bubbles are pressed together, you have a face. And then between three bubbles, like three bubbles, you get these things called channels. And then where the channels come together, you get nodes. But the liquid is mostly in these channels. So you've got three bubbles coming together. And they're basically these red things in here. Those are the channels between, the, between three bubbles. So that's where all the beer is being stored in the foam head, is in these channels. The faces are kind of pressed up against each other. There's no beer between them, but the channels. So liquid's draining through the channels. Um, here's a, a microscope movie we took of some channels in a, in a actually it's in an emulsion, but it's the same as in foam. So it's flowing through these, these things. And these are like pipes, right? This is like some kind of complicated, self-assembled network of pipes that your beer is draining through. So we want to understand about these pipes. And the question is, are they rigid pipes or slippery pipes? Right? I mean, these aren't real pipes. They're made out of bubbles. And bubbles seem slipperier than pipes, right? So if they were rigid pipes, if they were working like you know pipes in our house, you would expect that the speed is fastest in the center and goes to a no-slip boundary condition at the boundaries. I know some chunk of you do fluid mechanics uh, in your PhD work or whatever, so that you understand this. If they're slippery pipes, then you'd expect that the speed is the same everywhere, that you're just going to have everything flowing like a plug. And then the drainage would be faster. All right, which, which do you think this is? How many people think that beer foam is a rigid pipe? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many people wish I was handing out free samples of beer right now? <laughs> All right. 
so we did some experiments on this. And, and I, I will confess right away, we, did, we only did a couple experiments with real beer. We mostly used model systems. We uh, made foams with water or protein or small soap molecules. We added particles and we visualized them with the microscope. Um, so here's a movie we took on the left. And what you can see is that in the center of the channel, the particles are going quickly. At the edge of the channel, they're going slowly. This is more like a rigid pipe. And this is with proteins, like what you get in beer. Here's our velocity profile. So it's really going as, you know, obviously it's not as nice as a cylindrical pipe. It's got a, a lot of details here. But it's really going to zero at the edges of the, of the channel and is fastest in the center. Um, so the speed is slowed down because the walls are like rigid pipes with these proteins and drainage is slower. Um, we did some experiments with some smaller soap molecules, so SDS, a very common physics soap molecule. And then here we saw that there's a slippery boundary, and we got more like a plug flow, where the flow was, was so the drainage is faster if you use smaller surfactant molecules. But the point is that in beer, you've got these big proteins left over from the yeast and the hops and everything. The protein slows down the drainage. And this is good. Guinness beer adds proteins to make the drainage even slower because they want a long-lasting head of foam. The idea is that if you see this, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll pay more for that. And that's good for Guinness if you pay more. So Guinness actually engineers their foam by adding in more proteins. It doesn't affect the flavor. It just affects the appearance in the glass, and you'll pay more for it. And this is why they do it. Um, so they use nitrogenated beer, which are smaller bubbles. So this, the channels are also smaller. So you get slower drainage because of that. And then you've got the slower drainage because of the, because of the surfactants. So to end the talk, uh, the whole reason that we're talking about beer foam at all is because the whole process of making beer adds carbonation. This is different from wine and so forth. Uh, beer just naturally is carbonated. And then you've got the... Uh, surfactants. So now people are actually putting in thought process about, you know, how can we make the foam look better? How can we make it uh, better for the consumer? So now beer is, you know, greatly engineered on the things that we think beer should have, such as foam. Uh, so take home messages are nitrogen is good and proteins are good and drainage is bad, especially if you're trying to look at for a nice looking head of foam. All right. Thank you very much.